So I'm actually going to ask a big favor of everyone that's in the room. I'd like you all to move up forward. Is that possible? All right. So let's fill up the whole first five rows here. That's so much nicer when you're speaking to an audience than having it all scattered. Thank you so much. You know what? I'm actually um, stealth because we should have this. I don't have time. No intro. You don't need to interview. Just but I'll just say who you are. And yeah, I go. And then you, you, well, because you're going to tell what you do. Yeah. Like yeah. Well, like that, yeah. No, I don't. That's right. That's right. No, no, no. I do. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah. It's all good. All right. Bueller. Bueller. What's Bueller. that? Bueller. Bueller. <laughs> All right. So uh, I'm very, very excited. And, and another one of, of my absolute role models here in Silicon Valley, uh, Pascal Finette, and also a, you know an international guy that comes from Germany and some French, I don't know why I got French in, in there, but um, has a, a, an amazing story to tell. Uh, and Pascal is the director of Singularity University Labs. Uh, Pascal is also a, a um, champion for us uh, women in tech and women entrepreneurs. So I'm very, very yes. happy to, to oh, yeah. have him here. Oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> uh, so I'm just going to let you take over the show. Sure. Thank you. Um, well, this must be always my like favorite spot in the uh, in the whole like universe. It's like it's me between like me and beer, right? <laughs> so uh, I'm I'm trying to make this as entertaining for you as possible. What I want to talk to you today about is uh, something we teach at Singularity University. So I'm at Singularity University. We build startups. Uh, we teach a lot. Uh, I do uh, teach entrepreneurship there, and my background is. I founded, four, founded and sold, luckily, four startups. Um, I was at eBay in the early days. I did a little bit uh, short stint at uh, Google. Um, I was at Mozilla, the maker of the Firefox web browser. I co-founded a venture fund. So I kind of like had this great opportunity to see the whole entrepreneurial ecosystems from all sides. And the thing I really care about is entrepreneurship as a force of good. So how do you leverage entrepreneurship together with technology to be, have impact in the world? What I want to talk to you today about is the technology piece, because there's some really interesting stuff happening in the world. And I want to get you, give you like a little bit of an overview and take you on a little bit of a, let's say, an animated tour. Um, and let's start with this. There's a Chinese proverb which says that, may you live in interesting times. And uh, some people say that's actually a curse. And what I know to be true today is that we do live in very interesting times when you think about technology. Um, and this has a lot to do with the way technology is currently evolving. Before we get there, for you, I want you to make this the mantra of your life. The best way to predict the future is to invent it. If you want to live in a particular future, you have to build it. You cannot wait for it to happen to you. And this is a mantra which um, Alan Kay put out. And Alan Kay is a very interesting, famous guy. So Alan Kay was part of Xerox Park. And Xerox Park is down in the foothills of Palo Alto, not far away from here. And in, the, in a very short period of time, about six years, six to seven years, in the late 60s, um, Xerox Park, with only 200 people, invented a good chunk of what is today's computing technology. So they invented the laser printer, Ethernet, um, the graphical user interface, which was then copied by Apple to become the Macintosh, uh, as well as about 50% of what 
is known as the internet today. So Alan Kay said this, put this sentence out, because in, in what they did at Park is really invent the future they want to live in. This here is Alan Kay in about, the year was about 2006, 2007. And what Alan Kay holds in his hand, this is remarkable, what he holds in his hand is a, a folio, a little computer which looks a lot like your iPad today. Now the remarkable thing about this thing is, he invented this folio, he drew it on a piece of paper and like wrote the specs for it, what it should do in 1968. Now in 1968, there was no way in hell you could actually build this thing because computers were like a room full of electronics. But what Alan Kay could do is, and this is what we are talking to do today about is, he could predict the future. Now it took him 40 years to get like electronics to the degree that he can actually build this thing. But he could predict that computers will shrink in size and get as powerful as they need to be to build effectively the iPad. What I truly believe is a fundamental shift we are going to see in the next 10 years, 20 years, is that change will not be incremental anymore. A lot of the change we've seen in the last like 30, 40 years has been very incremental, step changes. But we're on a curve, which is what we call exponential technology, and this is what I want to talk to you about. So if you think about exponentials in like the mathematical sense of them, exponentials are these curves where like every step the, uh, the number doubles. The classic example is Moore's law. Moore's law stipulates that the count of transistors and thus the, pro the processing power of a computer chip doubles every 18 to 24 months. It's a classic exponential curve. And exponential curves look like this. Now, Moore's law is true for the last 50 years. So it just had its 50th birthday. Um, so for 50 years, we've seen that computers get twice as fast every two years. <coughs> roundabout. Now this is exponential curves. We're seeing these curves in many, many other industries as well. So it's not just computers. And that's what we're teaching at Singularity University. So we're seeing this in synthetic biology, nanotechnology, energy systems. You name it, you find these curves. Now as a human being, and this is the tricky part, as a human being you're really not used to exponential trends. What you're used to is linear trends. That's how we evolved as a spe species. So we're calling this the linear exponential deception. And uh, humor me for a second. Imagine you take 30 steps, 30 steps, just one after the other. You have a very good visceral sense how far that is. For me, it's probably from here to the sound booth. It's 30 meters if you're in metrics. It's 30 yards if you're in, in uh, imperial. You have a really good sense how far that is. You also have a really good sense how far half of that is, right? Now imagine you take 30 exponential steps. So every step, twice as far. I go from 1 to 4 to 8, 16, 32. Don't do the math. Give me your intuitive answer. What do you think? What's the first number which pops into your head? How far do you get? Just throw something out. To the moon. To the moon? Pretty good. <laughs> the typical answer you get, most people will give you in uh, imperial is a mile. In Germany, like when you have metrics, it's a kilometer, right? It's 1,000 units. In reality, you get 25 times around the planet. That is very close, indeed. <laughs> That's the power of a VC, by the way, because they run all these numbers in their head. It's like billions, trillions, I get those numbers. <laughs> but see, that's the power of exponentials. And the thing is, we as humans are really not wired, just physically not wired, to understand these trends. Now, let me give you this in an, in an example which makes this a little bit more tangible for you. Let's take information growth. The Eric and Wendy Schmidt, Schmidt Foundation, um, that's the foundation which Eric Schmidt, the guy who was the CEO of Google, set up, did an experiment. They determined how much information did mankind produce from the beginning of time to the year 2003. So if you were to take all the information we put out there, like the cave drawings, the musical, uh, discoveries of, Goethe, of, of um, Beethoven, the writings of Goethe, the Library of Alexandria, if you were to digitize all that information, it's a number of five exabytes. Number doesn't matter, five exabytes, okay? The same amount of information, those five exabytes, in the year 2010, we produced in two days. All of mankind's information 
five years ago, we produced in two days. Now, in 2013, we produced the same amount of information in 10 minutes. That is an exponential trend. Now, it goes the other way around as well. Let's look at cost. The cost to sequence a human genome, full human genome. When we did this the very first time, was 1999, uh, the Human Genome Project, it took us seven years, cost us $3 billion. Massive breakthrough for mankind. Take the whole human genome, decode it once. In, 20, in 2006, we did this whole thing for $10 million, a couple of months. Already orders of magnitudes cheaper. Last summer, a company out of Silicon Valley came out, Illumina, which makes the de facto machine for sequencing human genomes today, takes a couple of hours, costs you $1,000. $3 billion at the beginning of the decade to $1,000 today. Now, you talk to the people who teach um, synthetic biology in, in our university, they will tell you this price will come down to pennies. Literally, it will become free, very close to free. Reading DNA will become free. What you do with that is interesting. So once it becomes free, you can imagine a future where your toothbrush, while you're brushing your tooth, does a full genomic scan of all the viruses and bacteria in your mouth and gives you a full health scan every single time you brush your tooth or you flush your toilet. So there's some really interesting implications which happen with this. And as an entrepreneur, you can look at this and you can build for this future, right? So we talked about this notion of like there's these exponential trends and there's this linear curve, which is our thinking. There's an interesting thing which happens in this curve. <coughs> there's a part in the curve where you expect technology to be better than it reality is because exponential trends always start out slow. The classic example I can give you today is Google Glass. Google Glass is expensive, it's not super useful, the battery life is terrible. When you wear it, people tell you you're a dork. Yeah. That's the friendly version of it, right? So you're disappointed. You're like, hey, this is like, I thought this is gonna change my world, but it doesn't. But technology creeps up. Technology gets better and better and better and better. Until you come to the point, and this is the magic crossover point, when Steve Jobs gets on stage, shows you the iPhone for the very first time, and the world sees that the phone looks like this thing. This is the crossover point. This is what we call the knee of the curve. And then you walk into a world of chaos and amazement. This is where Nokia dies because they can't see it. And this is where, when you look at stats at the moment, um, for smartphone penetration, smartphone penetration in uh, Kenya, currently 7%. In three years, north of 90%. In three years, every Kenyan will be on the internet. That is the power of exponential trends. And again, you can build for this future. These trends are also very, very stable over a long time. This is coming from one of our co-founders, um, co Ray Kurzweil. So Ray was interested in Moore's law, and he said, okay, so I get Moore's law, and it's like 50 years, it's a very stable trend. If I take a longer period of time, is it actually stable over these long periods of time? So what they did is they came up with a somewhat artificial kind of uh, calculus because obviously before you had transistors, you cannot count the number of transistors. So they came up with something they call calculations per second per $1,000. How many calculations can I do in one second if I were to spend $1,000 of that period's time? And then they plotted this. And this is a logarithmic chart. So the reason why this is not looking like an exponential is because we are using a log scale. And you see it's incredibly stable over 100 years. Now here's a, an interesting trivia piece in there. It's kind of like the entertainment piece. The scale goes from 10 to the power of minus five to 10 to the power of 10. So the delta between compute power in 1900 and compute power in 2000, whenever it ends, 2000 something, five, eight, is 10 to the power of 15. 10 to the power of 15 is 1 million billion. According to Wikipedia, that's the amount of ants which live on this planet, which is fun. But here's the thing. If you were to try to draw this graph as a normal non-logarithmic graph, and you think the first point is one inch high, right? So if I were to draw this, the, lo the lowest point is one inch. The point at the far right is 66,000 times to the moon. So that's the power of exponentials. Now you can do something else. Humor me and assume that Lewis Moore stays stable over the in the into the future. There's some people say it doesn't, there's a lot of people say it will. If you, now you can extrapolate into the future, when will computer become computationally as smart as humans? 
because we know how many computational like units a human brain has. We can calculate this. This point will happen in about the next 10 years. 2025 is roughly the point when we have a computer which will be as smart as a human. Smart in the sense of computational power. Now, you extrapolate this further, and in 2050 to 2060, computers will be as smart as every single human living being on this planet combined, a single computer, okay? So there's something really, really fascinating happening here. Lots of food for thought. Then we can talk about like, should we be on this planet if we have like computer overlords? Different story. Now I wanna talk about one last thing here, and then I go into many, many great examples. The Wright brothers, the first time they did um, powered flight, the first time we as humans flew, 1903 Kitty Hawk, incredible achievement. 1969, we put the first person in a commercial supersonic airplane, the Concorde. So in the lifetime of a person, there was actually there's people living at that time who saw people not flying at all to people flying supersonic, okay? So if you were to take all the change which has happened between 1900 and 1970, not just flight, all the technological change, and you index it, we see the same amount of change happening between 1970 and 2000. 30 years of change, 70 years of change now in 30 years of change. We see the same amount of change happening between 2000 and 2010. 70 years of change in 10 years. And we see the same amount of change happening between 2010 and 2014. That is exactly the reason why when you look up, you're like, shit, I cannot keep up with the stuff which is happening in the world. Because technology and change is going at a, such a rapid pace and it's only going to get faster. Now again, you can choose to be overwhelmed by that, and it is overwhelming, or you can choose to see it as an opportunity. The entrepreneurial mindset argues that you should see it as an opportunity. Let me give you one last framework. This comes from Peter Diamandis, who's our, uh, another one of our co-founders, and he calls it the six Ds of disruption. Uh, also Peter Diamandis, just saying. <laughs> it starts out with uh, exponential trends are deceptive, right? So they start really slow. So you're, they're deceptive, you're not seeing them. They eventually become disruptive. This is the point where the lines cross. Ultimately, and this is interesting, Everything and anything which can become digitized will become digitized. This is very obvious in media, but think about the, the uh, genomic sequence. The genomic sequence is four letters, GTACs, and it's about three gigabytes per genome for a human, like on the human genome scale. Your genome will become digitized. There's no question about it. Many other things will become digitized. The second thing which will happen is anything and everything which can become dematerialized will become dematerialized. This is a good example. This is not just a phone. This is, what, a radio, it's a communication machine, it's a photograph machine, it has a flashlight. All these things become dematerialized and shrink into a piece of, you know, like a little piece of like whatever, like electronics. That's bad news if you're in the business of building flashlights. That's bad news if you're in the building of building like cameras. That's bad news if you're, building, if you're in the business of building radios, because now a radio is an app, or which costs you like zero or 99 cents. The biggest change here is that you suck money out of the system. This is where, you become, where it becomes a disruptive force, because this stuff becomes demonetized. Because suddenly you need, don't need to build a flashlight anymore for like 15 bucks manufacturing cost, but it's like a little tiny LED which costs you like close to zero. And then when that happens, Stuff becomes democratized. And this is the beauty. This is the moment when 90% of Kenyans are suddenly on the internet and have access to Wikipedia, edX, and all the other like learning uh, instruments. They have access to online marketplaces, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, this is what Peter Diamandis calls the six Ds of disruption. Now let me take you on a journey. This is the fun part of it. So now we're getting out of lecture mode. I'm calling this tomorrow today. The reason why this is tomorrow today is because this stuff is real. This stuff is not something which I'm showing you which is like from a, you know, like a weird lab somewhere like 15 years out. This is the stuff which is hitting the market either already or it's very, very close to it. It starts out with like networks and computing system. That's the kind of stuff which is closest to us. I only show you this because it's like, let's get warmed up. So very obviously money will go away. 
Like you will pay with your phone, there's no question about it, in one form or the other. You will also use your phone as a digital identity. So uh, the state of Iowa just uh, issued a note, a bill, which says that their driver's license will be soon, will be digitized and will be on your phone. There's good reasons for it. A, it's secure, more secure. Uh, you can make a phone application significantly more secure than a piece of plastic or paper or like a coin or something. And secondly, uh, you can update it in real time. And thirdly, people actually pay more attention to their phones than to their wallets these days. So it's much more likely that you will lose your wallet than your phone because you're much more attached to your phone. Okay, so next step, also very obvious still, it becomes closer to your buddy. Because why would I want to pull out my phone? It's kind of weird. I see you guys like all like picking up your phone. You want to have this in, like closer to your buddy, right? So watches in, what, in some form or the other will become uh, the future. No question about it. This is a guy I met in, um, in Germany. He's actually an American guy. And I do not recommend doing what he did, but it's fascinating. He performed surgery on himself, and underneath that tattoo, he has a full-scale computer wired into his arm. So that is probably radical. But there's a very conceivably new term future, and we'll show you other examples around this later, where you will have variables actually implanted into your body. And they will do anything from like, your, they will become your digital identity. Um, they will become uh, enhancements of your bodily functions, et cetera, et cetera. So wearables, like we are already seeing this, like they move from like the clunky thing you need to pull out of your pocket to something you wear on your body to something you will probably wear in your body very soon. I give you a little anecdote. So I'm a, a long distance runner. I'm pretty fanatically about this. And I know a lot of like very professional long distance runners. I talk to them. And there's a whole bunch of people who say, if I can have a heart rate monitor, which today is like a strap you put around your chest, if I can have that as a little injected thing, I would do it immediately in a heartbeat. And to be frank, if I would, buy, if I would be able to buy a heart rate monitor for Nike, which I can like just shoot up in my arm, I would buy it too. So this is an interesting future. And this is the course of it. What you're seeing here is a golf ball. There's a dimple in a golf ball. Inside of that dimple is a chip. That chip is 2 millimeters by 1.6 millimeters. It has the compute power of an early stage Pentium. So the people who are as old as I am, they remember. Bill, you will remember this. <laughs> <laughs> these computers, these big computers, right? Like they were like these big things you put your feet on. They, they heated, they heated your, uh, your office, right? All this you now get in 2 millimeters by 1.6 millimeters. And it cost you 75 cents. So for 75 cents, I get a decent amount of compute power, which means for me as an entrepreneur, everything and anything which has an electrical outlet will become computerized. You attach a little sensor to it, you can do anything with it. And everything and anything which isn't computerized will become computerized because you can power these things with a tiny little solar panel. So I thought this was really cool. This chip you can buy today came out last summer. I thought this was really cool. And then I went to the Computer History Museum about four weeks ago, and they showed me this. This is the next generation of this. What you're seeing here is a fully integrated computer. This is not just a chip. This is a full computer, RAM, ROM, graphics cards, everything on a mini computer. So that's the reason why I believe computers will become ubiquitous and ambient. They will just dissolve into our environment. Computers are not big boxes anymore, which you put underneath your desk. They're just everywhere and around us. That's the reason why when you go to Intel, they will tell you there will be 20 billion IoT devices in something like five or seven years. Because they see this and they know that this stuff is coming. So think about this, for example, agriculture. Like you want to build sensors in agricultural -like, um, settings? 75 cents, I just sprinkle the, the sensors onto my grant. So, so much for computers. Let's talk robotics and artificial intelligence. Let's talk AI first. In the mid 90s, I grew up with this. Um, Deep Blue was the first computer to beat a human being in chess. Amazing, amazing success story. What's interesting about Deep Blue is a couple of things. First of all, chess is very easy for a computer to play because it's purely computational. All you do is you understand the rules of chess, and then you calculate moves into the future, and then you do probability analytics on like which move is the best move to make. Super simple. Requires a lot of compute power, which was the big breakthrough there. The second piece is Deep Blue barely won against Kasparov. Deep Blue won the first game, it lost the second, it drew a tie in the third, and the fourth game Kasparov actually threw. So Kasparov gave up, right? So barely won. Now fast forward to this. 
This is Watson, and I don't know if you know the show Jeopardy, but Watson played Good Jeopardy. morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. What do you say we play Jeopardy? All right, Let's all right. get right into the Jeopardy round. 400, same category. This mystery author and her archaeologist hubby dug in hopes of finding the lost Syrian city of Urkesh. Watson? Who is Agatha Christie? Correct. Same category, 600. Okay. So if you know anything about uh, Jeopardy, so Jeopardy is a game where you basically get the answer. You need to come up with a question. This is interesting for a computer out of one reason, because you need to make reason. It's not just raw compute power and looking up information. It's really hard for a computer to do. Now, what's interesting about Watson is two things here. The first is Watson not only won. So these two guys Watson played against are the world champions in Jeopardy. They're not just like some guys from the street. Jo so Watson won, not just by a little bit of a margin, Watson demolished, totally annihilated the German, their, their uh, human opponents, okay? The second is, when Watson played this, this was in 2008, I believe, 2009, Watson was a room full of computers, six computer racks full of co equipment. A couple of years later, Watson was the size of three pizza boxes. Today, Watson is an API. You're actually not even buying the hardware anymore. You can use Watson from your smartphone. So that's what's happening uh, when we're seeing in terms of like computing. Let me take you into a different direction. Let's go with robotics. What you're seeing here comes out of Stanford Research Institute, and these are tiny little robots. This is, the, uh, this is uh, real time, so they're incredibly fast. You see how small they are when you compare them with the coin there. Um, they can move up and down surfaces, so they do some really cool tricks. What I really like is you can swarm them. So you can actually take a whole bunch of them and actually have them do something in unison. So granted, this is a research project. This is not a robot which does something functional yet. But it shows you where robotics goes. It goes really, really small. Now, what can you do with this stuff? And people call this smart dust, by the way, because these things become the size of a corn of dust. So what can you do with these things? One of them is uh, medical. You can insert these things into, your, into the body, and they can destroy, for example, a gout stone from the inside out. There will be a future where you will have these robots inside of your bloodstream cleaning out your arteries at any given time. That's what's happening on like the small scale robotics. Now, also big scale, so you might have seen this. This is Boston Dynamics. Way down beyond the in the white the beast. Kingdom come. Let the big dog. So these are big dogs. Um, it's kind of mean to kick a robot. But it's pretty remarkable what you can do with these robots. They are um, incredibly stable. Like you see, this is Atlas. This is their, uh, their humanoid robot. Um, this here, most humans will not be able to do. I couldn't do this. Like standing on one leg and getting like a, a medicine ball thrown at you uh, without falling over is really, really complicated. <laughs> so Atlas is, again, like this is, this is researchy, but it's so close to market that I can guarantee you that in the next five years, you will see Atlas-style robots walking around doing tasks for us. Uh, so you will see them in warehouses packing parcels. You will see them as a first responder, for example. Like, you have a burning house, you just like put the robot in because the robot doesn't care, right? So robotics is something which will very dramatically alter our, our universe. If you've seen something like uh, Chappie or um, Ex Machina, Gives you a taste of where this stuff is going. Let's go into a different area. Nanotechnology, uh, mostly digital fabrication. This is interesting. So this is a 3D printer, very obviously. Um, was built by MakerBot. This is the first MakerBot replicator, um, built by a friend of mine, Brie Pettis. And here's where it is, uh, where even I fall for the trap of technology being deceptive. So he showed me this, this particular model, years ago. And all I could see is plywood, and some cardboard on the sides to keep the thing from falling apart. And Brie was talking to me, dude, like this is gonna change the world. We're gonna see 3D printers everywhere. Like everyone will have one on a desk, we will 3D print anything and everything, and I could not see it because it's deceptive. What I could see was plywood, right? Now today, we're, we're 3D printing anything and everything. So anything from like you have fashion, you print um, uh, guns, which is obviously very controversial, you print um, Teeth and bone replacement. Um, there's now dentists which take a 3D scan of your tooth if you get a crown. While you're sitting on the chair, they 3D print in ceramics and then you get a fully uh, formed tooth back on your tooth. 
Uh, if you go through like the typical process, it's like they take an imprint, they send it off to the labs, two weeks later, yada, yada, yada. The cast you see on the side is really wicked. So this came um, out of one of our conferences. When you break your arm, this company does a 3D scan of your, uh, of your arm, then prints a 3D um, a, a scanned um, cast for you. Now this cast has a couple of properties, which is interesting. First of all, it looks really cool. You kind of look Spider-Man. <laughs> Secondly, if you need to scratch yourself now, you can scratch yourself instead of using the ruler. <laughs> Thirdly, and this is really important, is you see the wires coming out of it. So this cast is not just plastic. It has like um, small metallic fibers built into it. The, the uh, wires give it a small electric current, which makes your bone heal between 20 and 40% faster. So now your cast actually makes your, he your bone heal quicker. Right? Uh, in Amsterdam, they 3D printed a house. In China, they're doing this as well. Um, we're using 3D printing to do medical grade printing now. This is a, a skull cap, um, which typically is a metal piece. Now we're doing a 3D scan and we print a polymer, uh, which is very close to bone material in its, in its composite. Um, so you get like a skull cap, which actually really fits onto your skull, et cetera. 3D printing is one of those technologies. If you think about like the, the, uh, the knee of the curve we talked about, which is really, really close to becoming like just standard technology. When you buy a pair of Nike ID today, like uh, Nike has a program where you can choose like your colors of the shoes, and you change, I, I challenge you to change the color of the sole. So they have like standard colors, like black, white, and so on, but you can also change the color to something really crazy. If you choose to change the color to something really crazy, they 3D print your sole. They're not telling you because it's a kind of their secret source, but they 3D print your sole. And we're seeing this happening all over the place. Let's go crazy. Let's do augmented and virtual reality. So augmented reality um, starts out with this, Google Glass, and you might have seen this. This kind is of your looks timeline. This. It's a row It's semi-boring. It gives you like a little window into your upper right-hand corner um, where you get like carts, basically. Yeah. So information about um, upcoming flights and you know, directions, e incoming email, etc. It's not super useful, but this is a first taster of what augmented reality can look like. Then. As this is Microsoft, I hope they actually showed you HoloLens, did they? No. Come on, what the hell? Okay, so if you haven't seen HoloLens, HoloLens is What if HoloLens we could go really further? What if we could go beyond the screen? Where your digital world is blended with your real world? Now we can. This is the world with holograms. What will they enable us to do? New ways to visualize our work. I have an idea for the fuel tank. New ways to share ideas with each other. How are things going your end? I just put the images in one drive. Perfect. More immersive ways to play. New ways to teach and learn. So put the new trap in the place of the old one. So, no. And tighten here. What's interesting here is uh, this is a very good example of what new augmented reality looks like. I had the great fortune of trying these things on for about 30 seconds before like someone from Microsoft formation. ripped them off my head again. Let's take and I played for 30 seconds, I played uh, Minecraft. So what augmented reality does, it, it takes the view of like your view and augments it. It puts something into this view field. Uh, in my case, when I played uh, Minecraft, I literally could take a brick from Minecraft and take it and put it somewhere else. And I could walk around the table because it creates a computational view of your reality. Um, it then can start rendering into this view. This is super, super interesting technology. Currently, when you look at it, and this is again where it is like technology is deceptive and it hasn't yet crossed over, a HoloLens is this like big type of lens thing you wear around your head. You kind of look really dorky with it, and it's like wired and stuff. It's like it's not super comfortable to wear yet. In the future, this will be just a pair of glasses, and then eventually it will just become a pair of contacts. Now, there's some really interesting use cases for this. Think about um, the elderly population. If you have Alzheimer's, for example, like this could be used. Like I look at you and I see like your profile. Like, hey, this is Jennifer, and I met Jennifer at you know wherever, right? Or I could use this, I've got stage fright. I can turn all of you into like little aliens. Like because like, you just now look like little aliens and I'm not need to be afraid anymore, right? Um, there's some really fascinating use cases. And there, there comes a philosophical question where you will have people who want to live in an augmented reality all the time. 
right? Because I, it's just the reality I like more. So really fascinating. There's a lot of that stuff happening. Take this one step further and you come to virtual reality. So virtual reality is really, I put you into a completely new world. Virtual reality is one of these things where I can stand here and talk until the dogs come home. You will not fully grasp. You will understand me and say like, yeah, yeah, sure, whatever. You need to try this on. Like we have a whole bunch of these uh, Oculus Rifts in our lab and like every time I bring someone over, I put them in this Rift. What this thing does, it gives you 120 degree field of vision, so natural field of vision, and it tracks your head movement. So regardless where you look, you're in a scenery. What you can do with this stuff is something like this. This is Marriott. And Marriott was interested in the question of how does my life look like, how does travel look like when I can virtually go somewhere? Right, so they did a little prototype and they built this uh, and put a bunch of like uh, newlyweds on it. So this sounds, for now it sounds kind of like, yeah, it's kind of, you know, it's an interesting experience. The piece here is that when you talk to people at Marriott, they actually believe that you will not do certain types of travel in the future anymore. You will go to Cabo in Mexico because like the sun is there and you want to go swimming and you want to get drunk in the evening, that's fine. But would you go to like Pisa to see the tower? Probably not, if you have a virtual reality experience. So there's some really fascinating stuff happening and I want to show you one little video and this is really funny, but this happens in my lab all the time. Let me explain what you're seeing here. So this gentleman has a VR headset on and he's going to get on a roller coaster. The reason why you see two images here is because the lenses are stereoscopic, so you get a full 3D view, okay? What happens is, and this, again, this happens in my lab all the time. Uh, and granted, this gentleman is probably a little, like, nervous. <laughs> so he's going up on the roller coaster, slowly, slowly, slowly. If he breaks Tavis's computer. And then it will go down into a tailspin and a few fox uh, uh, <laughs> That's it, that's it. Oh. Is, that for... Is that I? No. No, I'm done. <laughs> so there's a couple of things which are remarkable about this. The first is, uh, and again, like, this is literally like, this is an extreme version of what happens in my lab all the time. Um, there's a couple of things going on. The first is you actually lose your sense of place in, in space which is remarkable because you're not moving. You're just putting on these glasses, right? There's no physical movement and you think you're moving. You're feeling it in your stomach. That's number one. The second is you put these glasses on, it takes you about five to 10 seconds flat to forget in which reality you are. You completely lose the sense of the reality you were formerly in, right? You literally, you're like on this roller coaster. And then the third is, and this is really fascinating, which I personally find really interesting. So you can use, Virtual reality, obviously entertainment and gaming is a big use case, um, but you can use this, for example, for education. Um, you could very conceivably see me as a hologram using your glasses sitting at home. Um, you can use this to treat phobias, the fear of height. I can actually expose you to ever increasing amounts of height using this here, and people are actually doing this. The most remarkable thing about this is, and this is really interesting, and when you talk to filmmakers, they actually see this as a problem they need to address, is it builds empathy. So we did an experiment with a, a group um, I'm friends with. We went to Gaza, and we put a, a 3D camera rig into a recently bombed out house. So we filmed the house, basically, and you see like smoke coming up and people walking by crying. Um, it's nothing is really happening. It's just like you're in the house. We take this footage, we bring it back to LA and put random people on the Oculus Rift so they see this house, they're in the house. 50% of people start crying because they're literally in the house. This is an incredibly powerful tool you can use to build real empathy. I can put you into someone else's shoes. So there's some really, really fascinating opportunities here for us to, uh, to explore and build. And then again, uh, obviously entertainment is the big one. 
Let's talk biotechnology. So biotech is interesting because we are using uh, the human body, we are, we are uh, looking at the human body in a very different way. We are uh, thinking about living organisms very much like computer systems. And I'll give you a couple of examples. We talked about these tiny little robots. This is such a robot. This is a medical grade robot. It doesn't do anything yet. This is basically, it's a proof of concept made at MIT uh, for battery. So obviously when you have robots, they need energy. So this is the battery solution to it. You can safely insert this into a human body and you can flush it out later. Uh, the way you charge the battery is, if you ever used one of these contactless um, chargers for your phone, like with these bats, this is the way you charge it. Like you literally, you lie down on a mattress and it charges the little robots inside of your body. It's pretty interesting. Um, Craig Venter, the guy who uh, decoded the first human genome, um, created the first synthetic life form. This is a life form which is completely synthetically built. It has never existed on this planet by using GTACs and pushing them together. Um, this is one of our companies. They take a biopsy of a uh, cow, or in this case a pig, and they coax these cells to replicate itself, so they grow meat in petri dishes. This is the future of meat production. Meat production today is a really interesting problem. It, create, it needs a ton of water, um, as every Californian now knows. It creates a lot of uh, methane, which is a climate gas, and you can only do it at a very small circle around the planet in terms of the, the climate conditions. So in the future, very conceivably, we are just growing meat in petri dishes, and we're growing perfect meat. Yeah, no hormones, no nothing. Um, this is probably the most extreme example I can show you. This is an artist about three, four years ago. She took a DNA sample of herself and sent it off to a very advanced lab. What they did is they took that DNA sample, decoded it, so read the DNA, and based on the decoding of her DNA, recreated her facial features in a 3D file, and then she printed it. Because if you think about it, in your DNA, all your facial features are in there, right? Like the, your color of the eyes, like the way your, your face looks like. About nine months ago, I read on the, New York, on the Wall Street Journal, cover story on the business side portion of the Wall Street Journal, there's now a company which works with the FBI, they're using this in high profile crime scenes. So if you're com thinking about committing a crime, like a major crime, do not do it. Like you will be found out. <laughs> this is the future. And to give you an idea how this looks like, this the amino acids for each coding sequence in your construct will be You're displayed. using your programming you DNA today by using a web-based interface. Um, it's very much like GitHub, and you know, if you know anything about programming, it kind of like looks very similar. Like you take GTACs and you put them together. Um, DNA works a lot like object-oriented programming, where you've got like these functional code blocks. Um, there's a company which took the code block, if you want to say so, which makes the firefly glow and inserted it into a plant. So now the plant glows in the dark. Their big goal is to create glowing trees which replace streetlights. So you've got like a, an alley of, of trees which just like emit enough light that you don't need streetlights anymore. So this is how easy this is. Once you're done with this, you save the file and you send it to a printer, literally a printer, and you get DNA back. You take that DNA, which is dry, it's dry DNA, and you insert it into a blank cell and you grow your organism. That's the future. So super quick, I know I'm getting over time here. Um, Technology for the sake of technology is not worth doing. Very, very important. There's a big picture question for us, and this is the thing which keeps us up at, us at, uh, up at night, and this is the thing which we are driving towards solving with our startups at Singularity University. So you take this here, our wonderful blue planet. It is expected that we have nine billion people on this planet by 2050. Today, food is a distribution problem. There's enough food on this planet, it's just in the wrong places. Granted, this is a very hard problem to solve. Nine billion people, we cannot feed with the food we are currently producing. We need to grow agricultural output by 2% compound annually. We're currently growing at 1%. So comes 2050, we actually have physically not enough food on this planet if we don't do something about it. Take this, uh, unemployment. The uh, World Bank came out with a report which says that we need to create 600 million new jobs in the next 15 years to sustain, globally, sustain our current employment levels. Now I can guarantee you one thing, this is not gonna happen. It's actually going to go the other way because computers and robots and all this kind of stuff will actually take up jobs. We talk a lot to politicians about this because what we need to do is we need to redesign society. Like we need to get it to a state where we design society to be okay with like whatever it is, 20, week, 20 hour work weeks, 
30% of un unemployment rates, etc. Huge problem currently in, in Europe. Uh, you take climate change, depending on whom you ask, um, the sea levels will rise by 0.7 meters to 7 meters. Kind of the median seems to be at the moment around 2 meters. Whatever it is, it's going to be dramatic. We're already seeing it, very obviously. But if you think about stuff like food production, 70-ish percent of uh, land, especially in uh, areas like India, for example, which are used for food production, are flooded when we have two meters of uh, sea level rise. So huge issue. Uh, you take um, uh, poverty. Three billion people on this planet live on less than $2.5 a day. That's ins it's in insane for me that I can go into a Starbucks today and I can't drink a cup of coffee for less than $2.5, less than what these people actually make. And this is nearly half of our population. Um, you take sanitation, there's two and a half billion people who don't have access to sanitation. So basically this is what's called open defecation, like shitting, literally shitting on the streets, which creates uh, diarrhea as the number one killer in the world. There's more people dying of diarrhea than anything else. Water, 800 million people don't have access to clean drinking water. Water is a really interesting one because we know today how to make water drinkable. We can take the most contaminated water and make it drinkable. The process is called reverse osmosis. Requires a lot of energy. That's the problem. Um, when you look at energy trends, energy will become eventually free because solar is currently on this like massive downrise. So we, we have technologies to solve these problems. Um, and lastly, you take malnutrition. Malnutrition is a really uh, horrid one. Um, there's a child which dies in this world every six seconds because of malnutrition. So whatever you do, um, the message I have for you is, um, and this, this comes from Albert Einstein. Uh, he said once that we shall require a substantially new manner of thinking if mankind is to survive. This is a very dire outlook on the world. Now, you can choose to put your head in the sand and say, like, the problem will go away. You can choose to be really depressed about it. Or you can choose to take an optimistic view in the world. And that's what we are trying to do. And that's also my personal uh, opinion, my personal belief. I believe that if we put our heads together as humans, and because technology plays in our favor, because technology is on these crazy trends we are seeing, I actually believe we can solve these problems. And granted, technology is not just the single solution to it. There's a lot of like social architecting, et cetera, we need to do around this. Whatever you do, regardless where you are, what you have to do is, and this is the one thing I encourage you all to do, think and act big. There's way too many people in this world who are timid. We're playing it safe, we're playing it small. The time is not now to be timid. The time now is to play and think and act big. And I want to leave you with like a, a last thought and I leave you with la one last comment. The last thought is we've seen this, comment, this curve. In a lot of those industries, you are somewhere over there. We are in these inflection points. These are, in a lot of ways, the most exciting times you could ever possibly live in. And it's only getting more exciting. And I'll leave you with my last and my favorite quote. Uh, George Bernard Shaw said that the reasonable man, and I pardon that back in the day we were not talking about women that much, uh, but it, it should be inclusive. So the reasonable man adopts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in adopting the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man and woman. So this is the piece you need to take with you. You need to be unreasonable. There is no chance in hell that you do anything in this world successfully if you are reasonable. So uh, become unreasonable and you know, leverage technology, change the world, and make this a better planet, and uh, have fun doing so. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, Pascal. I wish I was a fly on the wall at Singularity University Lab, like every day. I want to be a test person for everything. Put in robots, do whatever you want. Really awesome, thank you so much. So I bet you guys have a couple of questions, so we, we will do that. Uh, raise your hand, I have two questions. Fran. You got it, okay. Yeah, hi, I'm just really curious where you find uh, digital currencies in, the, in your scale of... Uh, totally. So Bitcoin, Bitcoin-esque currencies. Um, uh, let me give you an anecdote. So I was just in... Um, uh, Argentina, and I booked myself into a very nice boutique hotel, a uh, little privately run boutique hotel. They asked me to pay with bitcoins. 
And we didn't even have the conversation. They're just like, hey, do you do bitcoins? Can you pay me in bitcoins? I believe digital currency is a massive breakthrough. It's a total game changer in, in uh, economies where you don't have stability. Um, it's also a massive game changer in economies where you have um, too much state control, which is the case in Argentina. They actually, like, the inflation rate is okay, but they, the state asserts a lot of control over the currency system, which they want to avoid, so they're using Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin itself, or like the technology behind it, the blockchain technology, has uh, implication, that's, that's the interesting thing, way beyond currency. Um, I'm hugely bullish on it. I don't know if like, we will see Americans pay with Bitcoin anytime soon, um, because like, our currency system works pretty well, and like, you, know, you swipe your credit card or you pay with your phone or something. Um, but in, uh, in, a lot of car in a lot of markets, Bitcoin will become a very large part of their economy. And blockchain will also do a lot of things outside of currency. Um, I'm very, very bullish on that. Great, thank you. Uh, one question, uh, more to I know, uh, Estonia. One question about the information. Uh, one theory says that uh, uh, now we have, uh, during two days, uh, such kind of uh, uh, couple uh, units, it's, uh, I mean, information than we had uh, uh, absolutely till 203. Altogether, uh, what we can do if you have such kind of uh, peak amount uh, all the time on the table, what we can do uh, to have more quality, not quantity? Oh yeah, yeah, sure. So um, uh, if I get your question right, it's a, it's the notion about like, okay, we're creating all this data, but is that data actually meaningful, right? Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, yes. And here's the, here's the answer. We need machines to actually sift through that data and actually make the, pull the meaningful pieces out of it. So we're currently, there's no question about it. Like we're currently producing a, a, a shit ton of data which is absolutely useless. When you take the self-driving car, Google's self-driving car, I forgot the exact number. It produces something like two gigabytes per second in, in terms of sensory data. Obviously all the data is like you just discard it, right? So you're building, you're building systems where you actually train machines to find the interesting pieces out of it. Um, so it's kind of like, uh, kind of like a run between like you creating data on one hand and you're creating inter intelligent systems on the other. The flip side of that is, if you take, for example, quantified self data, um, I'll give you an example. Uh, Google's contact lenses, they have these contact lenses uh, in Google X uh, which measure your glucose level. So they basically, if you have uh, diabetes, they measure your glucose level in your tear fluid. They measure so much data um, that they actually, they, they measure every second basically your, uh, your glucose level. They actually, the data is less accurate than if you measure a prick test. It's only about 80% accurate. But because you measure every second, you get an incredibly uh, detailed view of what's happening to your body in real time. So there's this like trade-off between the data might be not quite as good, but you have so much of it that if you apply data science to it, you actually get a much better end result. So instead of like just measuring like once or twice a day or three times a day if you're like really adventurous, you're measuring all the time. So you actually see that when I drink a glass of water, I see how my uh, glucose levels, my blood sugar levels actually move. And we see this in many, many other industries. So um, I believe like the big question for, for us becomes like from a computer science perspective, like how do we actually make sense out of data? Which is again like an amazing opportunity. I know I've got a bunch of friends who are data scientists. They're just like super, super happy because they're like, their job security is like right up here. Okay, let's, let's stick to ladies now, okay? Yes. Okay. Yes, ladies. Yes, sadly. So I want to kind of hear your thoughts on what government and key decisions have yeah. in breaking this. Yeah, so we talk a lot about this. Um, so first of all, I'm not a crazy libertarian. So I'm actually, I believe we need checks and balances in these systems because technology has dark sides. Actually, technology doesn't have the dark side. Technology is completely neutral. Right? Like you can split an atom to create energy and you can split an atom to blow up Hiroshima. The atom itself doesn't care. It's always the human component. So we need to have checks and balances for the humans in there. My fear is that this is happening so fast now that governments in the way they're currently configured cannot keep up with this. 
So they're trying to like overreaching, like regulate their way through this problem, um, which only makes the problem go to a different place. We saw this with stem cell research. So stem cell research, like uh, uh, Germany, for example, like pushed pretty hard against stem cell research. So all the researchers went to Singapore because Singapore was like, sure, like, you can do this here, right? So uh, we work a lot with governments to talk about like how do you actually design government and design the the systems to be agile enough to actually live in this world and provide services and value, like checks and balances in this world, which makes sense. I, I'm very firmly of the belief that we need to have regulation uh, to protect us from downside risk. There's no question about it. But it's hard for the way currently government is set up to do this. Thank, Thank you. you, Pascal. We could ask you questions um, all, all <laughs> evening here, and, and I'm sure that you will see some of these faces at Singularity University. Um, there might be someone that actually wants to apply. You guys have a program. Did you just close the application, or is yeah, it yeah, still yeah. open? So, okay. Yeah, we run a whole bunch of programs. We have an executive program, uh, which we run a couple of times a year, um, and we have a really amazing graduate studies program, um, which starts in two weeks. So uh, we have in two weeks, we have 80 students from all around the world, 40 countries, 50% um, of them female, 50% of them male, coming to Singularity University um, and immersing themselves in you know, this type of thinking and then building companies. Um, like Hoop, them. one of our companies that yeah. is part of the competition actually did that. Yep. Indeed. Oh, there you are, Irina, <laughs> an alumni from Singularity. Yeah. Indeed. Thank you so much. We have Thank something you. sweet Ooh. for you. Thank you. <laughs> it's not techy, but might be a robot in there. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I, um, I bet you're all very, very, very excited uh, about who has uh, won this competition. I actually know, or all the six group winners as well as the final uh, winner. And I see that the cup and the, why don't you guys come up with them and, and um, stand over here on the left hand side. So we have everything ready for when we start announcing it. Um, photographers and video crew, let's get the shots of the winners. As soon as we start saying that, before we announce the um, World Cup Tech winners, I'd like to let you know who has won one of the companies, um, Tinky uh, Sensorium, that has an iOS version and an Android version uh, that you can um, actually use. So let us know which one it is that you prefer. For the winner that won the passport uh, competition, uh, and that would be, see if I can say the name right, Raike Trader? Trader? Reike, it's not here. Come on, Reike Trader. Okay, well we'll find that person and, and sh ship it to them. All right, thank you so much. Um, so this has been really hard for the judges, I'll tell you. Um, Elin, that uh, Elin, do you want to come up here? <laughs> Elin, that has been. Um, Working hard with the judges after to go through all the voting and all that. Uh, it's been, yeah, c applause. <laughs> um, well, it's been uh, really interesting to follow all the groups. Actually, I've mostly followed them in, in the jury room since I've been uh, collecting the votes, but it's been uh, very intense. Overall, <laughs> all the juries have been very, very impressed by all the groups. So it hasn't been easy, but they have come to some conclusions. There's one group that was almost a tie, but uh, they chose a winner. So uh, good luck and uh, good job, all the groups. Thank you, stay here, stay here. Uh, can I have Klaus and Sebastian, you need to be behind the camera, so. Uh, and Zier, you're here, Reinhardt and Denise. Um, and then, of course, all our amazing volunteers that has helped out as well. I just want to make sure that you guys get all the amazing gratitude and applause for all your great work today. Good job. And Sebastian behind the camera. Thank you so much, guys. You've done an amazing job. I also want to thank uh, the organizations and companies that make this possible for us. Without their support, it's really impossible for us to put on these things as a nonprofit. 
Uh, so I want to thank again our global partners, uh, our global corporate partner Microsoft, our um, global innovation partner Qualcomm, our global bank partner Bank of the West, our global legal partner TLA Piper, and our global HR partner Trinet. Thank you so much for helping us. <laughs> and a special thank you to Garage Technology Ventures for helping us to reach out in the world. Thank you so much, Bill Riker. And uh, Fadi Bishara from Blackbox. I don't know if he's still here, but thank you, Fadi and Blackbox. And thank you so much to all the judges uh, and all the uh, amazing speakers we've had throughout the day. And last but not least, thank you to all the 24 amazing companies that have been presenting here today. Thank you so much for taking all the effort to come here and do that. Thank you. So are you ready? Do we have music? No? Okay. So I will start with uh, saying the group winners and the motivation to each winner. And um, when we call you out, just please step up to the stage and um, get your medallion. So we have the 3D printed medallions to the group winners. It says World Cup Tech 2015. These just came from the printers. And then, uh, and I don't know how careful you have to be with those, but, and then we have the cup, and it also says World Cup Tech 2015. It's made in very cool material that's light, but really stable, right? Maybe not drop it to test, but, <laughs> but it should work in suitcases if needed. All right, so um, let's start with the first group, Enterprise Software. The motivation for the winner is, the pitch was understandable. There is a real core technology that if, it's, um, if it is good, is extendable and scalable. Addressing a broad-based broad issue, both individual and enterprise, with very large market potential. <laughs> so the winner for the enterprise software, France and EverContact. <laughs> <laughs> congratulations, congratulations. And put on the... And um, for our health tech winner, the motivation goes, this is a differentiated technology and it is, it is really disruptive. People want to do the test and they want anyone to um, talk about it. So the potential is there and if someone can crack it, it will be very successful. Please join me in congratulating Hoop from Peru. <laughs> Singularity, hey. <laughs> All right. FinTech. <laughs> Sorry, Eileen, I'm having a hard time reading your text here. <laughs> um, they had traction and a novel niche. They're addressing a large market need with the technology and the team who knows what it takes to make it successful and the way to prove it successful. FinTech category, the United States of America P2B investor. <laughs> Krista Morgan, congratulations. Digital Media Mobile, a very clear presentation and it addresses an unmet need of a captive audience with some good underlying intellectual property. Is that easy to understand? No, not really. <laughs> so please join me in congratulating from the northern parts in my neighbor country where I come from, Denmark, Aporta Digital. Congratulations. Congratulations. You 
made us Vikings proud. Yeah. All right. I know. Yeah, yeah. It was very. It was very close with. Should we say that then? You wanted the judges wanted to say that it was very close with spottery. But there can only be one winner. <laughs> Good job. Congratulations. Oh, sorry. And now to the EdTech group. They address a large underserved market. It's a great cause, and the passion of the co-founder and the commitment is a great plus. Please join me in congratulating from Brazil, Levox. <laughs> Next Gen Tech, great presentation and market segmentation. And this guy handled the Q&A session with very high quality. They just wanted to add that, yep. So the Next Gen Tech was won by, I guess the United States gets two, Atlas Wearables. <laughs> Congratulations, Peter. <laughs> Congratulations. Wow, good job, everyone. Congratulations to you all. Ooh. So we also have the one that will take home the cup and uh, some money from us, some cash uh, to, to cover for whatever expenses and, and go out and enjoy and, and really celebrate uh, this win. Uh, we do have, I'm going to say who was in third place and second place, uh, but there could only be one winner, as mentioned. Uh, but just so you, um, we have the third, second, and first. And it is so close. It's just a couple of points difference from the um, different winners. In third place, with 54 points, Ever Contact. <laughs> Second place with 57 points, Levox. <laughs> First place and that knock it out, the ballpark or whatever you say here in the US, P2B investor and Krista Morgan. <laughs> Congratulations. And we have some of the prizes that you guys get from the partners as well as uh, from us and from our different corporate partners and, and venture firms that we work with, uh, as well as some cash to go and celebrate. Go have fun. <laughs> All right. Congratulations. Get up here, take pictures, tweet, and go crazy. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Oh, uh, we have an after party, so we can really celebrate um, the companies. Uh, it's set up in the demo area, so. Oh, and the bar is in the lobby in the other area. Okay. <laughs>